share here. All right, hello everyone. And I'm really excited to be here with you today and share a little bit about um, charting the life course to healthy living. So a little bit about me. Um, first and foremost, I'm a mom. Um, my kids are all older now. Um, my twins are 33. Um, and one of the twins, Ben, has a developmental disability. You'll hear a little bit about Ben as we kind of go through. I use some of his some of his life experiences, his lived experiences as, as examples to help to help with teaching. And he's totally okay with that and has given me permission to share. So um, just in case anybody's wondering. Um, and so you'll learn a little bit about Ben. And this is the rest of the family. I also have an older um, stepson, Zach, who is 30. I think he's going to be 37. Um, makes me feel really old. And then two little wonderful granddaughters. Um, so that's my family. And my husband, Tom, of course. Um, I work at the University of Missouri, Kansas City Institute for Human Development. We're a university center for excellence on developmental disabilities. Every state has at least one. And in, within the Institute for Human Development, we have the Charting the Life Course Nexus, which is a training and technical assistance center um, based around the Charting the Life Course framework. One of the main things I do is develop products. Um, so tools, some of the tools you'll see today um, are some of the ones that I've helped develop. And then also um, I work at, on developing training uh, modules as well. And then one of my passion projects is um, supported decision making. So that's a little bit about me. So let's go ahead and dig into what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start off with a brief overview of the Charting the Life Course framework. And I know some of you here may have already heard of it and be familiar with it, but I think it's always good to kind of get a refresher. And for those who haven't heard of it, um, it kind of brings you up to speed a little bit quicker. So we're going to talk about that just for a little while. And then we will dig into a life domain called healthy living uh, and talk about that, what that means. And then we're going to talk about how to use some of the tools for healthy living. And um, we're going to kind of virtually practice using them a little bit as best we can. Um, if we were together um, in, in one place, we would be sitting around tables and we would do some table work. But uh, we do the best that we can when we're virtual. Um, and, and we're thankful that we can do it this way as well. And then I'm going to give you at the end kind of some ideas of things you can do now, um, especially if you have a younger child. But also, if you have a child who is nearing transition age, some of the things that not only you can start doing, but some of the things that they can do to start getting ready to uh, to be a healthy adult and to start managing as, as best they can um, their own health care and their own healthy living habits. Um, so we'll talk about all those things in the next hour and a half. So let's start talking about charting the life course framework and principle. And again, all these pictures you see are, are all all been in, in various aspects of his life. So Charting the Life Course is a framework that, first of all, was created by families for families. It really started with a group of us at Missouri Family to Family um, just sitting around one day and, and talking, and we had a meeting of some type, and it, it just went into this, this talk about what do we wish as, as family members, and all of us at that time in, in Missouri Family to Family were family members. We were either parents, siblings, I believe either parents or siblings, um, or people with lived experience. And we talked about the things that we wished we'd known throughout our children, you know, at, at different ages, things we wish we'd ask about, things that we wish we'd consider. Um, just, just in general, all the, all the things, it's like looking back, right? Looking back, what are all the things that I wish I'd known then or talked about or asked about then? And it really just started with us sitting down and, and making a list, right? Um, and, and then we had this massive list because there were several of us that were working on that. And, and then we started kind of theming it and saying, okay, what are some of the things that are in common? Uh, and there were, you know, there were a lot. And so we were able to, to kind of put things into categories. And um, eventually we have a, a very active stakeholders group here that meets uh, four times a year, and they keep coming back for some reason, and they're they're wonderful. Um, and we we presented this this big chart that we had on on this like eleven by seventeen paper, and it had all these questions across these different categories that you're going to hear about here in a minute. 
And we thought, isn't this cool? You know? And they were like, yeah, it's really cool. Now, what are you going to do? And we're like, what do you mean? <laughs> and so they kind of, they kind of nudged us and pushed us a little bit to say, okay, this is great, but take it to the next level. Um, at the same time that that was happening, there was a meeting, um, I think it was in Wisconsin. So just to, to your neighborhood, your neighbors up there, um, and, and there was a, a group of people that met back in 2011. Um, it was family members and, and self-advocates. And they were really talking about, you know, when we plan oftentimes, especially historically, when, when you have an adult with a disability, you're just planning around that adult, right? And it's, you don't, nobody talks about the family. Nobody even considers the family. And, you know, there's so many reasons that you should, right? Um, and, and so they were really trying to find that balance of how do we keep the family at the forefront as well? Because we all know that families are so important to people as they're growing up, but also in their adult lives. When you have a child with a disability and they're growing up and they become an adult, oftentimes those families were still involved and were still very much a part of their everyday life, even if they no longer live with us. And really thinking about the influence of family, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through the framework. And they really wanted to, to do some work on that and really to, to work within our state systems throughout the United States and, and really think about how do we do better? How do we help people understand that people exist in the context of a family? And so um, the, the federal government was, was kind enough to, to give a grant um, where five, actually six states, um, Missouri was the mentor state, started to come together and talk about as a system and as a state and as organizations, how can we keep the family at the forefront while still supporting the person? How can we do better in supporting families? And so that was happening at the same time that we were having these conversations at Missouri Family to Family. And, you know, it, it all kind of was the perfect storm. And so this group of people that came together in this community of practice, they needed a, they needed something to build their, their work and their change efforts around. And the charting the life course framework became that. So they really helped us to move it along as well. So just, a, I wanted to give you that little bit of history. This wasn't something that just like popped up out of the clear blue. It was, it was kind of a mix of, of what was happening in the world of, of disability at that, at that point in time. The cool thing is, is that as we started rolling this out and, and training people and talking to people and people started asking questions, we really quickly realized that it was really something that worked for all families of all abilities and all ages, you know, and it, it didn't have to be disability focused. It, it, it could work for anyone. And I'll probably remind you of that several times, but it, again, it started out as, as that disability framework. And really, it's, it's created so that anyone, whether it's a person with a disability or not, a family that has a member with a disability or not, can really think about what's possible. What are the life possibilities in, in each of these life areas that we'll talk about? Because people don't often, especially when you have a child with a disability, you know, speaking from my own experience, you don't get talked to a lot, at least 33 years ago, we didn't get talked to a lot about what was going to be possible for Ben. We got talked to a lot about what he wasn't going to be able to do, right? And so we heard of a lot of, he'll never do this, he'll never do that, you know, and, and that can be very discouraging. And so charting the life course was built to be more encouraging and more strength space to really think about what are the life possibilities. It's also a way to, to share your vision, your ideas, your hopes, and also your fears. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go along as well. It's about having high expectations. If we don't set the bar high, there's nothing to live up to, right? So setting those high expectations and thinking about the possibilities and what can be and what the strengths are. It's about having conversations. And I put the difficult in there because it really is something that can help people to have conversations that otherwise might be hard to talk about it kind of just gives them a way to, to introduce ideas and thoughts that, that maybe people don't want to talk about and don't want to think about, but they should. Um, but on the everyday things, it's really about a conversation. I'm going to introduce you to some tools as we go through today. And like I said, I help create the tools. I think they're pretty awesome. Um, but it's less about filling out a tool, right? 
whether you fill the tool out or not, or whether you just use it to think about and to have that and to guide your conversation, it's really about changing your thinking. And it's really about having conversations within your families, with your service providers, with the people that help you plan, with your doctors and your nurses and, and healthcare providers. It's about conversations. It's about talking, people talking to each other and having a way to, to kind of frame that. It's about helping navigate the future, helping figure out how to have that good future that we all want for ourselves and for our kids. It's about advocating for what you want and making sure that you're not going towards things that you don't want. It's to help you problem solve, to plan, and to be able to communicate in different ways what you think is important. And finally, it's about thinking about a variety of different supports. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. And I apologize in advance. I'll probably be drinking a lot of water and maybe popping some cough drops because these air issues we're having affect me a lot because I have asthma. So health issues, right? Um, so you do what you have to do. So I, again, I apologize if I have to drink a lot of water. So we start with a core belief. This is what we always come back to. This is our true north of charting the life course. We believe that all people and their families have the right to live, love, work, play, learn, and pursue their life aspirations in their community. Now notice it doesn't say all people with disabilities. Again, while this was created for people with disabilities, it's expanded further. And even if it were just a framework for people with disabilities and their families, we in our field tend to silo people. We tend to put people in in these silos, it's like, well, there's this disability and there's this special health care need and there's this other disability and then there's this other thing. And we all have our own things that we're doing. And we tend to, to isolate ourselves in these different pockets. And we forget that we're all one people, right? And especially in the disability field um, and special health care needs as well, the more we can unite and we can have one voice, the stronger we are. And so we really uh, originally full disclosure, originally it said all people with disabilities and their families. And we changed it because we realized that it's like people with disabilities and their families are part of the all. And so it says all people. And again, it's about having that right, the right that everybody else has to, to live, love, work, play, learn, and, and really pursue what they want in life. We start by talking about focusing on the all. We want to make sure that systems and organizations, any entity that supports people and families are really thinking about all people, regardless of their age, their ability or their disability, their role in their family, are thought about in their vision, their values and their policies and their practices. And so anytime they're thinking about families, they should be thinking about all families and all people with disabilities. Because we know that, and I'm going to be talking specifically about disability again, we know that when we think about people with disabilities, only one out of four, one out of four, 25% actually get paid disability services. So if you look at this triangle here in the, in the white circle, that green part represents that one in four people. And then you have the other people, the 75% or the three out of four in that blue area, and some of those people are not known to the systems or to the organizations. And so historically, especially systems and organizations, they really only thought about the people they knew about, the people in the green. And they didn't really, they're like, oh, those people in the blue, we don't even know who's out there, right? And they didn't want to think about them because it's like, well, what if we, what if they all come to our door? Well, what if they do, right? So you need to think about them and you need to think about how can we make sure that everyone can have that good life, that right to live, love, work, play, learn that we just talked about, whether they receive those paid services in the green or whether they're in the blue and they're not receiving paid services of any kind. And so we want them to think about the all, all people. We also want to make sure that, that we're thinking about people in the context of family and thinking about that lifelong impact of family on the person. We know that, you know, the way we grow up, the way our family is, is you know, is organized or the, our val family values, our family traditions, our family cultures all have an impact on us throughout our life. 
Sometimes it, it affects us positively. Sometimes it affects us negatively, but it's something that is with you, whether you, whether you like it or not. And so we have to think about people in the context of family. Another reason is that many people with disabilities, when they become adults, do not automatically move out of the house. Um, they're often still living at home with their families. Um, you know, my son Ben still lives at home with us. You know, we kind of had a plan at, at one point that he would start living out on his own at a certain point, but along came the pandemic and threw some wrenches into that plan. And so we're having to go to plan B and think things about things differently. But even if he were living outside of our home, he would still be getting a lot of support and a lot of in, a lot of interaction with us as a family. And so, you know, we know that that he will always exist in that context of the family. And what we want to have happen, the reason we're really talking about families and people who have a disability or special health care need or a mental health need or whatever the case may be, we want to make sure that, that the person, the focused person we're talking about is able to be self-determined. In other words, have some control over their own life to be able to make choices and make decisions about their life, to be interdependent. Because really, what, what one of us is truly independent of all other people, we all have interdependency with other people in our lives. And then also to be productive and integrated and, and included in all facets of community life. But we know to, for that to happen, that we have to support families in ways that maximize the family's ability, the family's strength, the family's capacity to be able to nurture, love, and support all their family members, including that person with a disability or special health care need, to achieve their goals. And so that's why we talk about the person in the context of the family, because those things are so closely tied together. We also talk about about life trajectory. And we're going to talk a lot about trajectory today, um, which includes a, a vision, life experiences, and thinking about um, people throughout their life, throughout all the life stages. And I think this becomes especially important as we think about health. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. And so when we think about a trajectory, we start with a vision. So if you look at the purple bubble over here on the right, it talks about things that everyone wants in their life, right? So, you know, or anyone might want in their life, I should say, not everyone. So when we ask people, what's your vision for a good life is, they say things like, you know, to be with my friends, um, for my family to be a part of my life, to have, um, you know, money and, and, you know, enough money so that I can do the things I want to do, to have a job that I like or that fulfills me, um, you know, maybe to have a faith life if that's something I choose, to be able to take vacations, to be healthy, to have choice and freedom. Those are just some of the things that people might say. And I'm going to ask you later on to think about this yourself. So just keep that in the back of your head. We also, though, talk about a vision of what I don't want. And yes, while this is a strengths-based framework, we also want to make sure that we are clear about what we don't want. And sometimes we even start there. It can be very difficult as a family for someone to say, well, what do you want? You know, I've, I've had service coordinators come in and meet with, with our family and Ben and say, well, what do you want? What do you need? We don't even know what's possible, right? Um, but we we very early on knew what we didn't want. There were things that we knew were clearly something that we did not want for our family or for Ben. And so being able to identify those things helps us to keep our trajectory, right? And our trajectory is that, that line that you see that's pointing up towards that purple bubble. We want to keep that trajectory line pointed at the things we want. And we want to make sure that we recognize that if we're making decisions or things are happening in our lives, and we all know that things happen in our lives, right? They just do. Um, and sometimes our trajectory or our, our path will start going towards things we don't want. And so being able to recognize that right away and, and course correct and go back towards the things that we know we do want in our life is very important. And so that's why we, we want to make sure that we think about and that we're clear about things that we don't want in our lives. And so, you know, like I said, if you want to start there, sometimes it's easier to start there and work backwards and say, well, if this is what I don't want. What's the opposite of that? What, what do I want? What, are, what is the vision for, for the good life that I do want? Um, so just something to think about. We also want to think about our trajectory 
and how it relates to life experiences. Because really having life experiences is how you move towards the things you want or you don't want. It's how we move our trajectory. And so it's really important, and this applies to health just as much as it does to anything else, to start doing things at a very young age that help our children have the life experiences that will make them someday the adults that we want them to be or that they want to be. And so we know that things that happen in very early childhood, school age, transition age, affect what happens to us and what we do and what we become as adults and even into our aging. This is based on theory that goes back way before life course, the charting the life course existed. It's called life course theory. Um, it even talks about how the theory even talks about how something that happens in utero um, especially health-wise, something that happens in utero with the mother can affect the child um, growing up. Um, you know, so for instance, um, my one of my daughter-in-laws that, that just had the babies, or uh, one of the babies, um, she had COVID while she was pregnant. We don't know how that might affect my granddaughter later on in life because so much is unknown about that. But things that happen in utero, if the mom smokes or, or drinks alcohol, we know it's been proven to have some very um, significant effects on the child and, and, and later on in life as well. And so the same thing applies to things beyond health. Um, so if we want to have a child that grows up to be employed, it's important that when they're young, we start giving them chores, maybe give them an allowance so they learn about money. Um, you know, having normal everyday experiences like other kids do, even if we have to make accommodations for that to happen. They may not do the same thing, things the exact same way that other children do, but they can still do a lot of the same type of things. We also have to think about things like teaching our kids to say no. And again, I think this applies back to health because we know that people with disabilities and special health care needs are, are more likely to be people who become abused. And we want to make sure that we're, we're teaching our kids and, and young adults to say no and to recognize abuse and to tell someone if they are being hurt by someone. Again, this applies to any child, but I think it applies so much more to a child who is more vulnerable. We also have to think about things like, you know, we all make mistakes, right? What, what, who among us has not made a mistake? But sometimes we hold people with disabilities to a higher standard. Um, you know, I know when Ben was in school, I would get phone calls from the school about things that, yeah, he was doing that he wasn't supposed to be doing, but so were all the other kids. Uh, and, you know, I would, I would basically say, okay, well, what did you do? Well, I'm calling you. Well, what would you do if he was not a person with a disability that you could call his mom? well, we would do this, this, and this. I'm like, then do this, this, and this. And if you're not calling these other kids' moms that are doing the same exact thing he's doing, you shouldn't be calling me, you know? And so holding him to a higher standard was not something we were willing to accept. It's like, he's, you know, he's going to make a mistake and he's going to have consequences and he's going to learn from those consequences. But, you know, if you ask me to, to, you know, discipline him by the time he gets home from school, if something happened at school, he's probably already forgotten what happened. Uh, so it's not going to be very impactful. Um, so just something to think about is, is having those life experiences so that we can learn and grow just like anybody else. I'm get a quick drink of water. We also talk about the life domains and what's possible and what are the outcomes that we want in life. And so remember, I said we had this massive list of, of questions and things that we that we talked about and, and that we wished we'd ask about and that we thought other families should know about. And when we started kind of theming those and, and dividing them into categories, these are the categories that we came up with that, that seem to be recurring themes. The first one is daily life and employment. And that's just as what you do during the day, right? Um, if you're a child, typically your daily activity is that you go to school. If you're an adult without a disability, and hopefully many adults with disabilities go to work. And so in many states, um, there's a big focus on employment first and, and helping people to get jobs. And so daily life and employment is, is what we do during the day. I like to think about these in context of if I'm going to a conference, let's say an in-person conference, and I'm meeting a bunch of new people. You know, after we introduce ourselves, one of the first things people ask after you tell them your name is, well, what do you do? right? So we talk about our jobs or we talk about it while well, I'm a student. Um, and so 
you know, another thing that we talk about is, well, where do you live, right? What state are you from? Or in Kansas City, it'll be, are you from the Missouri side or the Kansas side? Because we have two Kansas cities. Um, you know, are you from north of the Missouri River or south of the Missouri River? All these different things that we have that we divide up the where we live. Um, but community living is not just where you live, but it's, it's, you know, do you have adaptations and modifications for your home? What are some of the different options that you have? Do you live in a house? Do you live in an apartment? Do you live in um, a condo? Um, you know, whatever that might be. Um, how do we get around the community? How do we, you know, have, do we have transportation? All of that comes into community living. And then when you're having that conversation, um, a lot of times we talk, we start talking about, do we have people in common? Are there people that we know, friends in common or family members or, um, you know, my last name, which is a married name, um, is, is fairly common in our area um, because my husband's family, they were, they were a big family back in the day. So there were lots of them spreading out. And so people will be like, well, do you know so-and-so St. John? And it's like, um, they're probably related, but um, so that, that falls under social and spirituality. So who our friends are, our relationships, um, the people that we know, um, what we do for fun, our personal networks. And also if we decide to have a faith community or a faith life that falls under there as well. Healthy living, which we're going to talk about a lot more today, um, and that really uh, encompasses a lot of things. And I always use that the example of you know as, as we're getting older, um, oftentimes we talk a lot about our health because that's what becomes most it, it becomes foremost in our lives of all the aches and pains and things that are going on in our health. Um, and so that's that's the healthy living part. Um, and then we think about safety and security. You know, we live in Missouri as is, is, what well, used to be. <laughs> considered tornado alley. I think here lately tornadoes are happening everywhere, but, um, you know, the, this area of the, of the country is, is very, um, likely to have tornadoes in the spring and, and sometimes in the fall and winter as well. And so how do we prepare for things like, you know, tornadoes and, and storms and, um, you know, do we have fire drills or drills in case there's a fire or some other kind of emergency? So how are we, how are we thinking about emergencies? What are legal rights and things that fall under that? Um, things around guardianship and, and supported decision making also falls under that. And then finally, we have advocacy and engagement. Um, you know, how do people have valued roles in the community and in, in, the, in their lives? Um, it's about setting goals and making choices and having responsibility and being leaders and, and supporting our peers and that kind of thing. So those are the life domains that, that we think about. Um, the thing to remember, because we're going to talk primarily about health today, but it's important to think about all of them because health can affect so many things in our lives, right? If we're not healthy, we might not be able to work or go to school. If we're, if we're not healthy, uh, we may not be able to live in the setting that we want to live in, or we may need lots of extra support coming into our home if we're not healthy. Um, if we're not healthy, we may not be able to go out and do things with our friends, or it may affect the way we prepare for emergencies or how we advocate and, and engage in our communities and in our lives. So health is very much, all of the, all of the life domains are interconnected, but health really can influence any one of them at any time. And then we talk about supports for a good life. And this is what we call the three buckets. And the three buckets are really just all of us, all of us use them all the time. When, when something new happens in our life, whether it's getting a new diagnosis at the doctor's office or, or something else happens in our lives, we want information. We want to know more about it. So if I go to the doctor and he tells me some new diagnosis, I'm going to go to the internet and I'm going to search and I'm going to find all the information I can find. Um, you know, I'm going to talk to other people about well, what kind of systems of support are out there. How do I navigate all the different things around this particular diagnosis? So once I get all that information, you know, I'm also going to say, okay, well, I want to talk to somebody in, the, in real life that's experienced the same thing that I've experienced. And that's where that peer support, like Carolyn was talking about, um, you know, with, with uh, Family Voices being the, the parent to parent um, connection for, for Minnesota. Um, it's really about talking to people that have been there, done that, and getting that same, you're, you're still getting information, but it's information that's, that's lived experience rather than just something you find on the internet or in a book or, or something like that. And so that's so important to, to help us with understanding and navigating and all the things that we need to do. And sometimes just knowing that we're not the only one, we're not alone. Um, and then finally, the green bucket is the goods and services. Sometimes we need the stuff right? We need the services or we need the equipment or we need, 
you know, some kind of, of different support. So like in the medical, you know, with a medical diagnosis, I may need to take medication or I may need to go to therapy or something like that. And so if you think about your own life and, and things that, that happen in your life, we often go to these three types of buckets, finding the information, finding someone to talk to and figuring out what we need to be, to be successful and to be, to, to do whatever we need to do as a result of whatever's happened. And then finally, our integrated support star. And the reason we talk about the integrated support star, um, we know that, that again, we have people that, did not, that don't receive formal services. Really, any of us that, that don't have any kind of a special need of any type um, would fall under this first circle over here on the left. We all are people who exist in the context of our family and our communities. Traditionally, in these middle circles, Sometimes with the best of intentions, our systems of support, whether that be DD supports, whether that be special health care needs, schools, um, sometimes wrap services so tightly around a person that it can cut them off from their family, their friends, their community with the best of intentions, but it still can, can be a, a barrier. And so what we want people to think about is this big circle over here. We want people to exist within the context of their family and their community and get supports where and when they need them. Maybe we don't need supports all the time. Maybe we just need them in certain circumstances or at certain times of the day or night or, or whatever the case may be. So we think about the STAR to help us provide those supports and not just think about paid supports only. And so when we look, about, look at the different parts of the STAR, I was just talking about the paid supports and we've been talking a lot about systems and things like that. That falls under the green, the eligibility specific supports. And traditionally, if you might go to a system of support of some kind and you would apply for their supports, they would only think about what are you eligible to receive, right? You would go, you would apply, you would go through some kind of an eligibility um, process to find out if you're eligible for their supports and then you would receive those type of, of formal system supports. But those supports alone are not going to get you to the life that you want. They can be a part of it, but they're not going to be the end all be all. And remember, not everybody gets them. Only one out of four might get those type of supports. So how do we think about all people and what kind of supports that all people can use, whether they receive paid supports or not? And so we think about the purple part of the star, our relationships, our family, our friends, acquaintances, people that we just come into contact with that can play a role in our lives, even if it's just noticing when something's wrong or that we're not there at a, at a place where we normally would be and somebody asking about us or looking out for us in, in a situation where maybe somebody's being bullied or somebody's, um, you know, not doing well at, uh, for some reason. So really thinking about all those different types of relationships that can be a part of our lives our personal strengths and assets, our skills, our abilities, the things that we know, our lived experience that we have. Um, you know, it, it's very, again, this is very strengths-based. What are we good at? What do others like and admire about us? What are some of the things that we actually have in our life, assets that we have, um, you know, the actual things, the, the things that we might need in our lives? So, um, you know, quick example, I always say I'm going to buy my son Ben a car, even though he may never be able to drive it. Um, and that's because if if we have that asset, that car, somebody else could drive him around to the places he needs to go. So thinking about the assets and our belongings and our resources, technology, who doesn't use technology? We're using technology right now. Um, so why don't we use technology more when we're thinking about supporting people? There's so many different things that we can use and, and that, that are yeah, you know, some things that, yeah, you have to go through a specialty service of some kind, um, but other things you can just go to the store and buy. For example, we have um, the cameras on the front of our house and the back of our house so that we can see if Ben's home alone, we can see what's happening outside our house. And if somebody comes to the door, we can have cameras inside of our house that we can just go to whatever store we want and, and find them. Um, they're everywhere. You can order them on the internet. So things like that, ev everyday technology that any of us can use. And then finally, things in our community. You know, our, our places that we go and the organizations that are out there, parks and recreation and community centers and senior centers and all different kinds of resources that anyone in that community can access. And so how do we 
have all of these different types, types of supports working together so that we don't just rely on one type of support to get to our good life. Because if you're only if you're only relying, for instance, on the paid supports, on the eligibility supports, if all of a sudden you become not eligible anymore, what's going to happen to your trajectory to a good life? It might start going towards the things you don't want. If we're only relying on the family, families get tired, families get older, families sometimes get you know health issues of their own. If the family can't provide those supports anymore, and that's the only thing that was getting that person to their good life what's going to happen. So the more we integrate these kinds of supports, the more we can ensure that people can have good lives. And that if one thing falls off, something else is there to help pick it up. And then finally, we want to talk about, um, you know, families and, and people with lived experience need to be the ones that are leading the change. They need to be one the ones talking to their legislators and talking to the systems and and going out into the community and making change happen. Uh, we can't rely on other people to do it for us. We have to be making our voices heard and leading the charge and be supported to do so. So this is just a quick recap with charting the life course. We start with the person in the context of their family and their community. These are the, the life domains that we talked about earlier that are all connected to each other. These are the three buckets of support that we just talked about. And then finally, the integrated supports. We also have our trajectory and our life um, stages that are all, again, one, one stage builds to the next stage. So now that we've talked about the overall charting the life course, I really want to dig into healthy living. And why talk about healthy living? Lots of reasons, right? As I said earlier, our health can impact all the other domains and things that happen in the other domains can impact our health, right? So things that happen at home, maybe you fall or um, there's something that happens at home where you get hurt and that can affect your health. Our jobs, you know, we get hurt on our jobs or some environmental thing happens. Um, all of those things can affect our health. We also know, as I said earlier, through, through life course theory, uh, we know that what happens early in life and even prenatally can affect our adult life and can, can affect how we age and grow. The other reason is we don't normally just sit down and plan around our health, and we should, right? Um, health can change at any point in time. And so having a plan for your health and, have, and thinking about your health and, and, and being able to respond when something happens in your life that changes your health is very, very important. And then finally, I was thinking about this this morning with navigating environmental and public health issues. We all lived through the pandemic for several years. We're still, I'm, one of my coworkers just had COVID the other day. Luckily, it's not as much of a, a, an emergency as it was, but it was something that affected all of our lives and it affected every aspect of our lives. The environmental things that are happening now with the smoke coming out of Canada um, is very much a health concern. Um, luckily, here in Missouri, we've got a little bit of the smoke, but New York, you know, Philly, Washington, D.C., and I don't know about Minnesota, but you guys are pretty close to Canada, too. Um, it's something we all need to think about. So those environmental things we have to think about that can affect our health. So it's so important to talk about health and think about health and, and plan for our health. So this healthy living domain, what does that really mean? So healthy living really just means, you know, first of all, first thing we think of when we think about health, right, is, is health care, right? Medical care, mental health, behavioral health, um, reproductive health, um, our long-term health, and, and well, it's actually where, where I'm stopping, but kind of our comprehensive health care. So the health care that all of us think about, whether you have a disability or some kind of a health care need. Um, that we all think about. All of us have to think about our health in general. And then we go to what we call the long-term health needs, which is where if you have a disability or you have something like diabetes or cancer or um, epilepsy or any number of, of different health conditions where you have to think about things more long-term and it's beyond that comprehensive health. And then finally, um, our wellness and our self-care. As family members, this is the part we often neglect and we really shouldn't because it can come back and bite us if we if we sometimes neglect our own health and our own our own wellness and, and that self-care that we all need. 
So let's talk a little bit about each of these. So again, um, our comprehensive health care, thinking about our medical care, this is our doctors, nurses, um, you know, nurse practitioners, um, therapists, um, you know, physical therapists, speech therapists, um, occupational therapists, all the different kinds of therapies, um, having routine checkups and preventive care, um, just going when you're not feeling well, you know, going to urgent care, going to your doctor, having different procedures done all falls under medical care. Our dental and oral care, again, sometimes we don't think about that as being, you know, health care, but it really is because your dental health can really affect the rest of your health. Um, it can affect, you know, having, you know, gum disease, for instance, can affect your heart. Um, and so the dental and oral care is, is equally important with the medical care. And then fi not finally, but uh, our mental health, you know, being able to reach out for help when we need it and realizing that mental health is, is just as much a medical issue as, as any of the other things that we mentioned, right? Sometimes you need treatment, sometimes you need therapy, um, but there's such a stigma around it, but people don't talk about it. And so we have to start talking about it more. Behavioral health, um, you know, if someone has um, different behaviors, for instance, like an in autism and that type of thing, um, very important as well to get those behavioral health needs met. And our vision and our hearing. Um, you know, making sure that we we get those kind of checkups and making sure that our eyes and our ears are healthy um, so that we can maintain those well into our, our later years. Although they will change, I guarantee it, personal experience. And then, excuse me, our long-term health needs that we talked about. So sometimes it's about understanding our disability or our specific health condition. Um, communicating with others about it. So being able to explain your disability to your doctors or to other health professionals or to other people, asking for help or accommodations when we need them. These are all so important as we think about the things that we want our kids to be able to do, right? And you don't have to give your kids tons of details, but helping them understand, um, you know, why they walk differently or why they wear this brace or why they have to wear this patch or, or whatever that is and help them be able to explain it to not only other professionals and other people, but to other kids. Because kids are going to come up and say, what's that thing on your arm? Why are you wearing that? Um, you know, and then they need to be able to explain, well, I'm diabetic and I, I need to wear that so that I don't get sick. It helps me know that when I'm getting sick, even if it's something as simple as that, for them being able to understand it and tell other people in whatever way they can. Um, maybe they have a communication device where something can be programmed. So those are the kind of things I think that we can think about with our kids, um, that we can help them at an early age start to understand that, yeah, there are some things about you that are different, but we're all different. And this is, this is what your difference means and how you talk to other people about it. And this is a big one, asking for help or accommodations. Um, we actually put that into Ben's IEP at some point because he was not one that would ask for help um, when he needed help. He would he would just wait for somebody to notice that he needed help. And so it took us a number of years for him to be able to speak up and say, this is what I need and this is what I want. And now that he's 33, he actually, he can boss people around pretty good um, and tell him what he wants them to do for him. Um, but that was something we had to work on and something that we had to really concentrate on and practice and, and for him to understand and get comfortable with being able to do. Um, and then also, you know, things like diagnostic screening and testing. Um, we've all been there, done that, right? Um, whether we need home care, personal care, specialty care, nursing, um, you know, keeping track of things. It's a lot easier now. Um, you know, I used to, well, I still have it somewhere, a big notebook, right, of, of all the things about Ben's care. Um, you know, now you've got all these wonderful online programs that your doctors and your hospitals can hook you up to that, you know, instead of having to write down a, a list every time you go to the doctor of all your medicines you're taking, it's all there. And you can just, you know, tell them that one's right, that one's not, right? It, it makes our life so much easier. But having some way, whether it's electronic or whether you're still a person that likes the paper, keeping track of records and having that, that care notebook of some type, whether it's, like I said, it can be virtual, it can be physical. Um, and then, you know, for those of you that have younger children, you probably don't want to think about it yet, but, um, you know, it, it happens. Transition age happens sooner than you think it will, and it will creep up on you. And so the things that you can start to do now with your child and in your child's life that can help prepare them 
for the fact that they're going to someday be young adults that are going to have to attend to their health care needs in some way or another, even if you're still there, still there helping them, even if they have personal care, even if they have all these things, how can they be as involved as possible in their own health care needs, whether it's everyday health, whether it's long-term health care needs, whether it's it's their wellness and self-care, um, helping them start to think about some of those things and putting them in the IEP and, um, you know, teaching your kids at, at young ages, the things that they can start learning about and can do it. And as I said, we'll talk about some of those really specific things at the end. Okay. And then finally, wellness and self-care. Um, you know, things like having healthy meals and snacks or nutrition. Not that we have to always eat the healthiest things, but uh, helping people to understand what's healthy and what's not as healthy and understanding what are some of the sometimes things and some of the things that you want to have more often. You know, those are the kind of things I think that we can teach our kids. Um, you know, we don't want to make them obsessive about it, but you want them to understand that, you know, sometimes the choices they make are, are the healthier choices and sometimes you know, they're, they're going to want to eat McDonald's um, and that's okay. Um, the sometimes things are okay, but understanding that, you know, you kind of want to go for some of the healthier stuff when you can. Our fitness, our physical activity in whatever way we can, you know, even if it's someone who uses a wheelchair, um, if, if you're taking them out for a walk, you know, have them pump their arms, you know, get them going in, in that physical activity any way that you can um, in whatever way that they can. And then thinking about our, our wellness and our well-being. And, you know, I used to do yoga and I'm going to start doing it again because it was something that I really liked and I just didn't make time for it anymore. Um, you know, things like looking out for, you know, our stress levels and, and, you know, all those different types of things. And so really taking care of ourselves and taking that time to relax and, and sometimes just taking some me time, whether it's taking a five minute walk around the block. Um, it can make a big difference. Just, you know, it, it's okay to think about yourself. And then it's okay, you know, to teach your kids that sometimes you need to take that that wellness break as well, that stress break, or, or you know, having that safe place where they can go and just chill, um, you know, and 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 be and and be okay and, and and get to a place where they can come back and function in the world again. So let's talk a little bit about our day-to-day -day healthy living and our routines. So this is the first tool I'm going to introduce you to. This is a trajectory tool. Um, remember, we talked about the trajectory earlier, and we're going to break this down. Um, and I am actually am going to send all of these tools that we're talking about to Jamie and Carolyn, and then they can share them um, on, the, on the conference website or however they are able to share them um, with you guys. And then also at the end, I also have a couple of slides where you can actually go pull them off of our website. So you'll have a couple of different ways to get to these tools. And again, remember that the tools are something that, yes, you can fill them out. And sometimes it's really good to fill them out because getting things down on paper or on electronically um, can really help us focus. Um, but sometimes it's just a way to, to, to focus our conversation or to, to get us to really plan and, and to think through things. So um, use them in, in whatever way works for you. Um, and don't feel like, you know, I'm a person who would fill out every inch of this thing, um, but not everybody's like that. So pick and choose what makes sense for you and what doesn't make sense for you. That's okay. There's there's truly no right or wrong um, on any of these tools. They're just there as, we call it a tool in your tool belt, right? Sometimes you pull them out and use them and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just, you have it in your head um, and that's okay. Any way you use them is okay. I think I just said this. So not so much about filling out the tools as it is about the conversations and thinking. So remind yourself of that. So it all starts with an overall vision. So when you look at this tool, I'm, I'm pointing the arrows towards, I'm pointing like you can see me, but I'm pointing my finger towards what the purple arrow is pointing to. So that first box, that smaller box there is a vision of what I want. And I want you guys to think about maybe even type into, into chat or you can open up. There's not that many of us on here. If you want to just say, just say one thing or type in chat one thing that you think makes a good life for you. What, what is something you want in your life? We're not talking about health yet. We will in a minute. But what's something overall that makes life good for you? And I'm going to open up chat so I can see if you guys type in chat. Let's see. Oh, you guys are quick. Uh, connectedness, relationships, having somewhere to live. Absolutely. 
having a garden. Oh yeah. Uh, close friends and family. Let's see. Friends, having the people important to me around me. These are great. And these are the kind of things that, that many people think about when they think about what they want for their good life. And I think it's so important to focus on that first, because remember, health affects everything. And so as we're thinking about our health, we want to think about, you know, how is this going to affect my health that's then going to affect what I want in my life? Let's see if we had anybody else type. Nope, but these are good. Whoops, I'm sorry, I went to the next thing and I did not mean to. I was trying to advance the, the chat. Trying to do two things at once, not my forte, just being honest here. And then think about what you don't want in your life. What are things in your life that would make it not a good life? What don't you want? And type a few of those things in chat. Toxic people living in fear, poverty, debt. These are great. Anything else? Injury or illness. One of my favorites that people sometimes add to this one is drama. They don't want drama in their life or people that cause drama. All right. These are really good. And feel free to keep typing stuff in if you want. Oh, being isolated. All good. All good, you guys. Okay. And again, you want to have that vision of what you don't want because if things start going towards, if you see your life kind of going that way, what am I going to do to get back on that path of what I want to get to those things that I want? So we want to keep those. The reason we put that small box in there is we want to always keep those 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 two big visions in our life or in our minds, what we want and what we don't want overall in our life. And so then, and again, if you do this with your child, if your child's really little, you're probably going to be doing it from your point of view, right? But it's okay. It's also okay to ask that four-year-old or that five-year-old what do you want? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, what are the things that, you know, where do you think you want to live? You know, asking them, you might ask them more, more guided questions, but getting kind of their vision as well, because it's kind of fun to watch it change over time. You know, they might say, I want to be a princess when I grow up. Um, you know, that might change as, as they grow older, but in the back of their mind, they might still want to be a princess, but they might they make it a little bit more focused, right? But kind of see how it changes. And, and it's also good to involve your child in that kind of thinking of, you know, and then what are the things that make you feel icky or that you don't like? You know, I don't like spinach. Okay, that's your prerogative not to like it. You might still have to eat it, uh, but you don't have to like it. So asking them the things they don't like is, is okay as well. All right. So then once you've kind of thought about that overall vision of a good life and what you don't want, then we're going to dig into health. So what is your vision for a healthy life, for healthy living? What are the things that's going to make it good? And what are the things that you don't want to have happen? And sometimes I think in this one, especially with health, I think it's so much easier for me, at least, to think about what I don't want for my health and for healthy living. Um, and think about healthy living in the context of all those things we were just talking about. Your overall health, right? If you have some kind of a, a special need. So for instance, like, like I said, I have asthma. I have some other health issues. So I'm going to think about it in the context of, of what are those long-term needs that I have that I also want to think about my health. And then thinking about your wellness, um, your well-being. Um, what are some of the things that, that you think about with your vision for a healthy life? And again, feel free to type in the chat. We'll make this as interactive as we can. Movement. I don't know if that was a new one or if that was already there. It's new. Overall feeling good. Awesome. Good sleep. I will tell you, not to talk about my own health too much, but um, I recently had, I didn't know what it was at first, but I ended up having a pinched nerve in my, in my neck and right about like where your cervical and your thoracic spine come together. And it was causing like a stabbing pain in my shoulder and down my arm and causing numbness in my fingers and all kinds of weird stuff. But it was like constant pain and it was causing me not to be able to sleep. 
not to be able to function. I mean, I was just a mess and not being able to sleep, I think was the worst thing. I, that sleep is so important. And now that I'm feeling better and getting some treatment and things and being able to sleep, it's just like every morning I wake up, it's like, oh, I slept like five straight hours before I even woke up, you know? So yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Um, so yeah, being able to be active, staying physical, good sleep, uh, say no. Yeah, so those pinched nose nerves are, I, those. this was my first and hopefully only, it, it was a wake up call. It's like, I'm going to do everything I can to be as, as healthy as I can so that I don't have anything like that ever happen again. Um, Cause yeah, I'm, I'm still, it, it's, it's a months long process to get back to anything normal, but it's a reminder that as parents, as family members, as caregivers, we have to take care of ourselves because I'll tell you what, I was pretty useless to anybody, including my son, um, when, when I was in the, in the, in the worst of this, you know, I, I didn't want to eat. I couldn't sleep. I was in pain. I was grouchy. I couldn't lift things. I couldn't do things. And so I wasn't much help to my son and I probably wasn't very much fun for him to even be around. Um, so taking care of ourselves is, is something. So as, as we're thinking about these things, yeah, we're thinking about our kids and we're thinking about our family members, but we should also be thinking about ourselves because we are equally as important and it's equally as important, equally as important for us to think about our own health. And then as you see, you can break it down and you can, you can even list like, you know, what kind of health issues am I having or am I worried about, you know, um, are there, are there specific disability or diagnosis concerns? Um, like I said, you know, with my asthma, I worry about the the environment and, and the, the different things, you know, like the smoke and the different things that are in the environment. Um, you know, what's my vision around fitness, nutrition, and wellness? Do I have one? Should I have one? Um, you know, am, is it something that I'm making time for, for myself? Um, and then we also think about, you know, what are the things that we don't want for our health? And this is probably a lot easier for us too. So just type a few things in there. What don't you want for your, for your healthy life and your healthy living? Pain. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> to lose independence. Absolutely. It's a scary thing to not be able to start to, to, to have something happen where you can't do things for yourself. It's not something I want to revisit. Being stuck in one spot all day without being able to move around. Yeah. Yeah. Adding medications. Yep. These are great. Not having access to a gym. Yeah. My physical therapist, though, has been showing me all these. It's like, oh, you can do push ups by doing this. And I'm like, Stop thinking of all these exercises I can do without going to a gym. Uh, but yeah, he's a, he's a wizard at it. All right. And again, you guys can keep thinking about this, but and adding stuff if you want to. I'm going to keep moving on just so we can get to everything. Okay. And I just went the wrong way. There we go. Okay. So this is just an example. This is kind of the vision of, of what we want for Ben and what he wants. Um, it's kind of a combination because if you ask Ben anything on any given day, he might only talk about one thing. Um, if he's talking about you know being fit, he's going to start talking about wrestling and then he's going to get off on a tangent. So sometimes if you want a lot of information, you have to ask the family members as well. Um, so for a vision of, of what Ben wants and what we want for him, we want him to, to be active and stay active, to be healthy and fit, be physically strong. Um, as I said, that'll get him started talking about some of his favorite wrestlers right there. Um, to be at a healthy weight. Um, he, he went through a health crisis. We had no idea he was having gallbladder issues and he was gaining weight and had just a big old belly and um, ended up having a health crisis where he had to have his, his gallbladder taken out. But um, and so it was, he was able to then get back to a little bit healthier weight. I mean, he lost like 10 pounds overnight just from having the gallbladder out and all that nasty stuff. But anyway, um, access to, to fresh food, you know, vegetables, fruit, et cetera, um, being healthy enough to do all the things he wants to do, to live where he wants to live, to do the kind of work he wants to do, to, to have the kind of recreational things. Um, he wants to be able to play basketball. He likes to work out, although he gripes about it while he's doing it. Um, th some of the things we don't want for Ben. And again, this is where you don't get as much information from him because it's hard for him to conceptualize 
kind of like the things I don't want. Why would I talk about that? Right. Um, so this is harder for him, but, um, you know, both of my husband and I's family have things like diabetes and heart disease. And so we want to make sure that we do everything we can to help him avoid those things as he gets older. I mean, he's only 33, but those kind of things can start developing at any age, um, to have other serious health issues, like the whole gallbladder thing that he had, um, you know, us being more in tune. He doesn't tell us when he's necessarily feeling pain. And, and so until he was really sick, we didn't know there was anything going on. So how can we be more in tune to him is what we're thinking about. Um, to be sedentary or to be inactive, um, to be in an unhealthy weight, um, to have hospital stays and surgeries. He does not like being in the hospital and all the stuff that goes along with it. Um, to have his seizures be out of control, um, to be so unhealthy that he has to be in some sort of an institution or nursing home. Those are all things that we hope to, for him to be able to avoid. And so that's kind of the vision for Ben's healthy living, just as an example. Another way that you can kind of think through your, your healthy living vision, you, all, you always want to keep those other, those other domains in mind. You don't want to just forget about them, right? And so um, this is a tool that we have, and I'm not going to go through how to fill it out and all that stuff, but it, it's pretty self-explanatory. This one is called a family perspective tool. So you as family members, um, this is your view, right? So, and if you have a small child, or even if you have a child that's getting older, or you have a, an adult family member um, thinking about, you know, what, what do I want my family member to do during the day? When they grow up, do I, what, what kind of a job do I think they'd be good at? Um, you know, what's my vision for where they, they want to live? And again, this may turn out to not be their vision, but I think it's good for you to have that vision as, as they're growing up. So you can kind of help point those things. And again, health is going to affect how all these things, how all these things come together. So just kind of going through this and, and helping it, it kind of helps you to think about how is health going to affect this? How would health affect this? And how can we make sure to do some things that'll that'll get them on the path to being able to do the things we want them to do and still be a very healthy person or have a healthy life? So again, just an example. And this is one that we we did on behalf of Ben. Um, and again, I'm, I'm a filler outer. Um, I will take a tool like this and go, oh gosh, I just can't wait to fill everything out. And I'll come back to it. And I'll, that's the thing about these tools too. If you, if you actually do fill them out, don't think you have to do it all at once. It's about having the conversations. It's about thinking about things and putting it down and leaving it alone for a day or two or a week or two or whenever and come back to it. And then revisiting them as, as things change, you know, with, with kids, they change all the time every year you know, think something's different about them. I love seeing the, the pictures at the end of the school year where people took a picture of their kids at the beginning of the school year and at the end and seeing how much they change. And that's how much things can change in all these different areas that, that we're talking about. So any of these tools are something that you want to revisit as, as your child grows, as things change. Um, so just something to keep in mind. And then finally, back to the other tool we were the other tool we were talking about. And so, um, as you've noticed, the life course tools are are not teachers are, are like what they're not left to right progression. We start way over on the right with our vision, right, and then we move all the way over to the left, and we think about. And again, this is a step you can skip if you want. It doesn't. It's not something you have to do, but sometimes it's it's helpful to look back and say, what's worked in the past. For, for healthy living and what hasn't worked, right? So like for Ben, you know, there have been medications that have caused his seizures to get worse. Um, there have been medications that, that you know, interact and interact well together. Um, you know, having, having a healthy emergency like he had, um, you know, with, with his gallbladder, that's something that doesn't work and we, we wanna make sure we can avoid moving forward. You know, things that do work, we've, you know, when he became an adult and we had to find somebody besides a pediatrician, uh, we were able, his his um, pediatrician actually, it all worked out, um, had, had kept treating him for a few years into his 20s, which probably shouldn't have done, but um, he eventually um, gave up his own practice and went to a pediatric practice. And they're like, yeah, you can't bring these adult patients with you. Um, so we had to find a different doctor. And so um, his the nurse practitioner that had been with our pediatrician for years actually went to another doctor, to an adult, to a general practitioner, and we were able to follow her. And so he was able to keep working with that same nurse practitioner that he'd had as a child now in adult care. And so that was something that worked really well 
in his kind of transition to adult health care. So just thinking about some of those things, you know, with your child or, or your adult family member that or yourself, if you're doing this for yourself, what are some of the things that have worked with your life and, and have, have helped you be more healthy and, and, and make good choices about your health and other things that, that maybe have caused you to be more unhealthy or that have had things help happen with your health that you didn't want to happen. So it's just kind of a reflection. Like I said, you can skip that if it's really something that you don't want to do, but um, I think sometimes it's good just to even think about it if you don't write it down. And then finally, um, you know, this can be something that can be very goal oriented. So, you know, if you're thinking about your healthy life and what you want to have happen and what you want to avoid, well, what are your next steps? What are you going to do to keep that moving forward? Um, you know, like I said, we're thinking about all the things we can do to, you know, maybe get Ben more comfortable with talking about, you know, if he has a stomach ache, just to come and tell us about that. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to have to go to the hospital. It just means that we need to be aware that you don't feel well. Um, you know, us noticing some of the cues that maybe we missed when he was when he was having his health issues that that maybe we didn't notice. Um, you know, we're used to looking for things like seizures and other things like that, but we weren't used to looking for the gastro issues that he was having. And so, you know, how can we help him move forward and, and make sure that we're noticing the things that we should notice? Um, things to watch out for as well. So again, this is just another planning piece. Um, you know, if you're going to an IEP meeting or something, this is also something really helpful. Um, you can do it on the health one. We have trajectories that are also just the, the plain everyday, you know, what I want for a good life and what's, you know, what do I want moving forward that's that's involves all the things, not just health. Um, you can bring these to the doctor's office and, and sit down, you know, like with your, with your, um, I forget what they're called, but, you know, some of the doctor's offices have, um, you know, people that'll sit and talk to you about, you know, planning for your health and things like that and, and really, you know, showing them some of the things that that you want to work on and that they, they can they can give you some advice or help with. So again, just tools that you can use and, and you can use them in whatever way works for you. So hopefully I've already sent Jamie the, the PDF of these slides. So if it's something that you decide you want to work on and go back and either work on for yourself or for your child. You know, you can go by these through back through these slides step by step um, to kind of help guide you on that. Um, and hopefully that'll that'll give you the, the help that you need um, to be able to, to utilize them. Um, this is another another tool that we have that um, it's on our website. And I don't think I sent it, Jamie, but I can send her the link. We're actually in the middle of redoing this. So it'll it'll be a new edition coming out, hopefully soon. Um, it's what we call our life experiences and questions booklet. Remember all those questions I talked about that we put on the big sheet of paper? They eventually went into a 20 some page booklet. Um, and so when you look at it, the blue is, is our healthy living section. And so you've got, I'm pointing again, like you can see, but if you look at the left hand side of the tool or of the, of the document, um, you see that's prenatal and infancy. So if you have a very small child or if you're pregnant, things you can think about. Early childhood, what are some of the things to think about there in each of the different kind of subdomains of healthy living? And then finally, school age. Um, and then you also can go into transition adult. This is like a two-page spread that you're seeing um, spread out across here. So if you're if you're wondering, like, what are some of the things I should be thinking about at my child's age or looking forward to the next stage of life? Um, this is one thing that can kind of help you think through those things. This is just the health section. There's a section for every one of the domains as well, but I wanted to show you what we had for health. All right, thinking about when you go to the doctor or interacting with healthcare professionals. So this is a tool um, that, that we developed and, and actually something I'm going to be working on to this one I think is great for, for a family member to help somebody with, or, or maybe um, an adult with a disability who um, is able to read and write and, and do some things like that. But um, anybody can have a discussion with someone about these things. And so it's really helping a healthcare professional understand more about you or about the person, right? And so looking at the top on the left, it's it's who's in my who's my personal support team? So that can be mom and dad, it could be siblings, it could be friends, it could be whatever. People that are in your life that are not paid to be there, that are kind of part of your health team. So they might be people that might come to the doctor with you. Um, it might be, um, like I said, it might be the parents. It, it could be anybody that's, that's an important person in that person's life. 
The formal supports in the middle, that's where if you have paid staff, so maybe um, you have a personal care assistant or direct support professional of some type, um, if the person lives in some sort of a residential setting, who are some of the staff that are there? So for instance, if they're going to the doctor, they might be accompanied by someone that's a paid person to be there. It's really important for the doctor to know sometimes who's with the person. This really comes into play when they're an adult, but I think it's it's things to start thinking about and information you can start compiling um, for your child when they're smaller as well. Um, I've had people look at this and go, oh, this is great. I don't have a kid with a disability, but sometimes my sister takes them to the doctor. Um, and this tool and another tool that I'm going to be showing you are really important for them to, to kind of take along and, and to be able to share. Um, as Again, as people become adults, you know, who has legal authority to make decisions around their health care? Um, you know, they may be their own health care or their own um, their own persons. They don't have a guardian. Um, they can check that. Maybe they have a power of attorney or more than one power of attorney. Those can be listed if they have a guardian, um, if they have a conservator. So it helps the doctors and the professionals know that either this person can make their own health care decisions or someone else needs to help them. And this is how they are helping them, either power of attorney, guardian, et cetera. The bottom part I really like, and I think this is great for kids as well, especially, it's it's ways that that medical professionals can help your child or, or the person, whether they're an adult or a child, to, first of all, understand the different things that they're talking about, that they're suggesting, recommendations they're making, or instructions that they're giving, um, how that person communicates and how they need to be communicated with, and then how they follow through. So for instance, the middle section is like, you know, what do I need or who helps me with these things? Who helps me understand and who helps me communicate? Who helps me with following through? But then what are things that the health professional can do? Oh, they could write things down for me. Um, you know, it's great. At what, I'm still going to physical therapy for my neck issue. And when my therapist gives me a new uh, exercise that I'm supposed to do at home, I told him, I'm like, if you don't give me some kind of a piece of paper or send me something in email that tells me how to do this and reminds me that I'm supposed to do this particular exercise, by the time I get home, I'm going to forget something about what you've told me. So I need something written or I need something sent to me in an email that I can then you know, again, the email thing has, it's great. It has photos and everything, right? Um, so I can look at the photos and say, oh, I'm supposed to do this with my hand while I'm doing this with my neck. And, you know, it, it guides me through. Same thing for a person that has a disability. Sometimes they need photos or pictures. Um, ben doesn't read and write very well. So having photos, um, having, he, re he relates very well to pictures of things and it helps him talk about things as well. Um, and understand things. So having those different kind of instructions there that you can write down for them, for the, for the professionals. About communicating, um, you know, repeating my answers back to me, asking me to teach back instructions. So if you tell me how to do something, have me show you, have me tell you how I'm supposed to do it, make sure that I'm doing it right. Um, you know, asking me questions, um, you know, sometimes, you know, giving me instructions in, in more than one, one mode, right? Um, and then do I need you to send me reminders by text or by email um, about follow-up appointments or about different exercises or things that I'm supposed to do? So again, this can be something that you can use to kind of help other people understand how you or your child or whomever you're supporting um, communicates and understands and follows through with things. And then this is what um, it looks like filled out for Ben. And again, I, I'm, a, I'm a detailed person. There's the, lots of stuff right now, but most of the stuff I just talked to you about that, that helps Ben. Um, also, you know, reminding the doctors to talk directly to Ben, not to talk just to, to the people that are with him. Um, really important. And then this is called today's healthcare visit. This is one that I really want to work on um, more for the person that, that they can understand it a little bit better. Um, but it, it's something actually that that I use because again, when I go to the doctor, I get that, what was I going to talk to him about? You know, I know what's wrong with me and why I'm there today, but there was something else related to it that I was going to talk to him about. And then I forget. So, you know, being able to complete this before the visit and talk, you know, write down, um, you know, my current list of medications or how to get to that, right? Mine's on, um, you know, my healthcare thing that the doctors give me. Um, 
do I have a plan or a card that pays for my medication, right? Do I have Medicaid? Do I have insurance? Those kind of things. Have I recently seen, seen any other doctors or my dentist? Was there any particular thing that I want to write down about that? And then why am I going to the doctor today? Uh, what are my symptoms? What are the things I want to remember to tell them about what's going on with whatever's going on with me? Um, questions I want to ask today and then a place to write down the answers. Probably need more room for all my questions. I always have questions when I go to the doctor. Um, and then takeaway information. So if they changed medication or made diet changes or gave me some kind of a treatment plan, um, things that can be written down there. I think this is great. Like if somebody else has to take you, a person to the doctor, take your child to the doctor, um, you can send this with them um, so that they can, you know, they, they can write stuff down and bring it back to you so that you'll know what happened. Um, we started having other people sometimes take them to the doctor. His twin brother took him one time and I'm like, did we tell him everything we needed to tell him? And so having something like this that we can have things written down on and you can flip over and write more notes on the back. Again, it's just another tool for you to use and, and to have in your tool belt. <laughs> I like this, I like your comment. What is great about this is once it's written, you can't chicken out to mention it. That's awesome. You're right. That's a perfect observation. I love it. This is just an example of, of how I filled it out for, for a doctor's visit. Okay. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but I think, you know, it's, it's important to start thinking about, especially if your child is 10, 12 years old, transition is coming sooner than you think, right? Um, and so, you know, thinking about the fact that when your child becomes an adult, um, unless you become their legal guardian, um, you're no longer going to be the, the final decision maker about their health care. Um, they also can say who goes in and out with them and, and who sees their medical information and records. Um, you know, I know that when Matt went off to college, Ben's twin, it's like not so much the health care, but it's like, I don't have a right to look at his grades unless he tells me I can, you know, all those different kinds of things that happen with transition. But these particular things around health care to think about. Um, this is a decision-making portfolio. Again, we have lots of portfolios on our website. So if you want specific ones around different things, go looking for them. They're all there. But I'll make sure that you get this one. So this is really thinking about, and I think this is a good one to, to think about as we age, right? And think about what are the things I want to make sure that I decide about my own health as I get older. Even if I, you know, if I can't speak it anymore, I want somebody to know these things. And so being able to fill this out for our own lives, I think is really important as well. This is something that you can look at as, as, as your child is, is nearing transition age or at any point in time to think about what can they do on their own? What are they going to need help with? And what are maybe some of the things that they're really going to need somebody else to decide or do for them? And I'm going to show you the specific one. This one is just about healthy living. But I also wanted to include some like, what are some of the things you can do? What are some of the things that can help with that? So, you know, if someone needs to be able to take their own medication or follow a prescribed diet, there's all kinds of ways you can set up medication reminders electronically and, and to have physical things that remind them. There's pillar medication dispensers. A lot of this is very technology-based, I'll, I'll tell you right off. Having a visual schedule on a tablet or a phone to help them remember at certain times throughout the day they have to do certain things around medication or diet. Um, all things that you can use. Day-to-day -day fitness and health and wellness, having your health app on your smartphone or on your watch. Um, I've got my watches program to tell me to stand up um, because I sit all day, right? Phone timers. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, having those those things on your watch or on your phone or, or on a tablet or something that, that can remind them of different things. Um, you know, as something that keeps track of your steps. Um, I like to look and say, well, have I gotten anywhere close to my goal for my steps today? Do I need to just go walk around the block a couple of times? Um, you know, having exercise equipment or figuring out things that you can do at home where if you can't get to the gym, how can I be active and how can I do some of the things that maybe I could do at the gym if I were there? Um, and again, things like remote monitoring. Um, now the smart watches, they can actually tell if you fall. Um, they can tell if you are having heart issues, AFib, and different kind of things like that. Um, you've got medical alert services. There's so many things around health um, technology-wise that we can use to help people be more independent. And so even if you have a smaller child, there's things that they can, you can start teaching them how to use some of these things, right? Um, you know, even though Ben still lives at home, we want him to be more independent about taking his medication. So these things that we can put in place for him so that when he does move out or when he does live in a different setting than he's in now, 
he's able to do some of these things. And he's had practice doing them while he's around us where we can help him learn and help him practice and help him do things. Never too young to try some of these things. So some supports for healthy living. Again, you know, how we stay healthy is, is changing over the years. I think, you know, there's traditional things like, you know, when Ben was little for all of his therapies, we had to, had to actually go to Children's Mercy Hospital to get therapy. Um, now you can get people that come to your house or you can meet them at the gym or you can, you know, go to the swimming pool and, and, and do pool therapy. And, and there's so many different things you can do. So moving into some of those things that are less traditional and more that make more sense for us as families um, for, for some of the things that we need. And then this is what we call a starter star. So when we think about the star around healthy living, these are just ideas to get you started thinking, who are some of the people that are important in, in your healthy living? What are some of your personal strengths that you might have or that you could work on? Um, what are some of the technology things that you could use? What are things in the community, um, like health fairs and community health centers and, you know, having a city pool where you can go, you know, swim or walk in the water, um, things like that. Having a YMCA, having your neighborhood pharmacy where you get your prescriptions filled, um, all of those different kinds of things. And then, of course, your, your eligibility supports that you could think about as well. Again, these are not the end all be all and all the answers. These are just like if you're brainstorming and trying to think about it. These are things to get you started thinking. And then, of course, just having your own star. I recommend getting that star, whether it's for healthcare or, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, you have to leave. Good to see you. Um, you know, being able to have your own map, if you will, or having your own, your own bank of supports where if something does come up, you can go to that star and say, you know, who are some of the people that can help me with this? How can I use technology? How can I improve my own personal strengths? Or what do I already have? Um, what are things in the community? So having that kind of ready when you need it and not having to, to think about it when you're in a crisis or when you're in a situation where you really do need to think about the supports. Okay, so as I promised, some of the things you can do now. Um, so when we're thinking about um, disability specific things. And I talked about this a little bit, but in whatever way they're able to understand, talk to your child about their specific disability or condition and how that affects their overall health. Um, and again, it can be very simple. It can be like, you know what? You have, you have an issue with your leg and you walk a little bit differently. And so that's why you have to wear that brace and it helps your foot stay straight so that, so that you don't hurt your foot when you're walking or however you want to explain it and how they can understand it. Sometimes you might have to show them pictures or, um, you know, as, as children get older, if, if they need like a little laminated card or something that has their, you know, we, we, there, there are bracelets you can wear. There's different things you can have, but if they're not able to, to actually tell people what their disability is, have it on some kind of a little laminated card they can keep in a wallet or, or in their purse or whatever. Um, being able to, to talk about the different doctors they see. Well, we see this doctor just when we're not feeling well, right? But we see this doctor because you have seizures and he helps your seizures, um, you know, for you not to have seizures. And, and he makes sure that you're healthy with that. Um, this doctor helps with, you know, the fact that, um, you know, you have you have issues with your leg and you have to wear that brace. Well, that's why you see this doctor and and he makes sure that that your bones are growing and being healthy and things like that. So um, as they as they're able to understand it, talk about things like, you know, this is a doctor that anyone can see, but a pediatrician, a yeah, pediatrician is a, a doctor for little kids. When you become an adult, you'll have to have a different kind of doctor, um, this different specialist you see for this reason or whatever. So in whatever way your child can understand it and you know, help them learn to understand those different things. Um, some other things, you know, I always encourage any medical professional, we've done this from a young age, we had a doctor, it was an orthopedic doctor that he just impressed me so much. Ben was little and he would come into the room and he would ignore us until he had greeted Ben and shook his hand and talked to him just a little bit. And then he would turn in and talk to him. How are you, mom and dad? And, you know, ask us questions. But he always put Ben first and he always talked to Ben and he always treated Ben like he could understand, you know, in whatever way he could, what he was talking about. Um, and so we kind of insisted on that from everybody else. He, he set an example and like, that, that's how it should be. So encourage those medical professionals to interact and speak directly to your child, even if it's just to greet them and ask them a couple of questions, even if your child can't answer them, to be able to, to talk to them and interact with them is so, so important. Um, and encouraging your child in whatever way they can to greet and interact with the healthcare professionals. 
you know, if they're not able to speak, if they're able to shake hands, do a fist bump, wave, whatever it is, some sort of interaction so that you, you, they feel like they have some control over their act, interactions with the healthcare professionals. Follow your child's lead. If your child looks like they're consistently uncomfortable or they just tell you that they really don't like that doctor, consider maybe finding a different one, whatever, whether it's a doctor or a different healthcare practitioner. We all like who we like. And sometimes there are just people that just rub us the wrong way. It's going to be the same with your child. And so I'm not saying that you should drop every person that they say they don't like, but if it happens over time and it's consistent and they're just uncomfortable, you know, maybe you should find some, help them find somebody else that makes them more comfortable. And it'll come into play as they become older, as they have to switch to a, a, maybe an adult doctor from a pediatrician and really figuring out what kind of doctor makes them feel comfortable and what they don't like. Um, it, it's really important. Some other things you can do, talk to them about what medication they take and why they take it. They may not ever be able to, you know, like Ben can't go and he can't say, well, I take this medication because I have seizures and this medication and here's how I get it refilled. But he knows he takes medication every day and he knows that some of them are is because he has seizures. Other ones are because he has allergies. Um, and so he understands why he takes medication. Um, Involve them in taking their own medication in whatever way they can, whether it's setting reminders or having a pill dispenser. And again, you may still be there to be able to do it, but the more they can become independent and pill dispensers can be anything from really expensive, fancy ones to just little pop up things where it's like this is the one at night and this is one in the morning and here's the days of the week and we're going to learn about the days of the week that way, too. Um, so it, it can be something that, that doesn't cost a lot of money. Talk to them about things like insurance. You know, this, this insurance card is how we help pay for your doctor's visit. You can hand it to the, to the person at the desk when you go in and tell them that's your insurance card. Um, talk to them about things like co-pays and deductibles um, because, you know, again, everybody's abilities are going to be different, but these are things that we should talk to all of our kids about, you know, because all of a sudden they become an adult and it's like, what, what does a deductible mean? What's a copay? You know, I, I went through this with Ben's twins. I, you know, I had to teach him the difference. I'm like, I should have been teaching you this all along, right? Um, so what these things are and kind of how they work in whatever way they can understand it. Um, some other things you can do, um, just talk to kids about, you know, those healthy choices and meals and snacks and things like that. Involve your child in, in going to the grocery store or, or wherever you get your groceries um, and, and shopping for, for different foods. We have a farmer's market um, that, that comes to, is in town every, every week. And so, you know, going and picking out vegetables and things like that, um, get them involved in preparing meals and snacks in whatever way they can, right? Uh, making that, you know, uh, putting the celery, the, the peanut butter and the raisins on the celery or whatever kind of cute snacks you can help them, fun stuff that they can like, oh, this is a cool snack and I help make it. Um, even if it's just like holding the jar while you're doing it, whatever your child's abilities are, figure out a way that they can help and they can be involved. Make fitness fun, play games. Um, I, I loved, <laughs> my, my cousins and I do these step count competitions, right? You could do that with your kid. Who gets the most steps today? We're gonna keep track of our steps. We're gonna keep track of something else that we do. Having those competitions and making it fun. Um, going for nature walks and, and talking about things in nature while they're getting some exercise. Um, doing things with the parks and rec um, departments and community centers and things like that. Um, lots of fun activities. And you know, even if your child does things differently, um, a lot of places will have will help you figure out how they can be involved and how they can participate, um, depending on whether, you know, like I said, there's, I know in St. Louis, they have wonderful um, inclusion coordinators, like in their parks and rec department that help you with those things. But even if they don't, like when Ben was younger, we wanted him to take swimming lessons and we went to the Red Cross and they provide an extra person that could work one-on-one -on -one with Ben as part of the swimming lesson. So he was in the same swimming lessons as everybody else, but he had that extra person to help him um, understand and help him learn some of the things. So sometimes you just have to ask. Things that older kids can start doing. Um, they should be asking questions from you, from their doctors, from their specialists, from different people, asking about their specific healthcare issues or things that they're worried about. Um, they might not be worried about the same things that you're worried about. So even talking to them about that and helping them compose some questions that they wanna talk about when they go to the doctor. Um, 
you know, having them start asking questions about their medications they take and why. So if a doctor recommends something, they should be the one saying, well, why am I going to take that? And how's that going to help me um, in whatever way they can? Um, carrying an insurance card, even if Ben doesn't fully understand his insurance, he's got an insurance card that he carries in his wallet. Um, and he's been carrying a wallet since he was in early high school. Um, we wanted him to get used to, to doing that and to, to realize when he doesn't have it. Um, he loses it constantly in his room, um, but <laughs> eventually we always find it and it goes back into it. Usually it's in a pocket in the laundry, um, but, you know, getting him used to carrying that and having his insurance card in there, having his ID in there um, and, and being able to present those when he goes to appointments. Those are things that we all have to do. That's something that he can do as well. Helping to pay for their prescriptions. You know, Ben has a debit card and we make sure that there's money in his account so that um, he can pay for prescriptions and pay co-pays when he goes to the doctors and things like that. Um, some other things older kids can do um, as they're thinking about that transition to adult health care. If they go to a pediatrician, they could start making a list of things they like about their pediatrician. What are the things that they really like about their pediatric health care providers and what they don't like? And that'll help them then be able to eventually find a, an adult doctor, adult provider um, that, that has some of those qualities. So if you do a trajectory, I want my doctor to have these qualities. These are the things I don't want my doctor to have. And again, that trajectory can be as simple as you drawing it on a piece of paper. Draw a circle here, a circle here, and a line. What you want, what you don't want, how you're going to get there, and how you're going to stay on track. So super easy. Anybody can do it. Jane, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just wanted to give you the five minutes, although it looks like you're timing yourself. Just let I me am. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to have a little bit more time for questions, but um, oh, I like that. So Terry says this can be empowering for children, youth, and young adults. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the whole idea. So some resources. Um, <clears throat> these are what we call our um, life stage quick guides. And so they start at early childhood and go all the way up through adulthood and aging. So if your child is school age or if they're in early childhood, or if you're thinking about that transition to adulthood, they have all, they have a few questions on all the different life domains, but each one of them has a section on health. So this is the school age quick guide section on healthy living. So it's just some things that you can start thinking about at the school age or at whatever age of, of guide you plot. These are all on our website. And I believe, yeah, on the bottom of this one is, is, the, is the path that you can take to get there. And then um, this is just to our website page on healthy living. And so all of the tools that we've shown today around healthy living are all there. Um, so you can get to them there as well. As, as I said, I'm going to send them to Jamie and Carolyn um, for you to access as well. So yeah, we have a few minutes left for questions. And I would love to Anybody want to, that wants to open up their mic or just type into chat, I would love any questions. Or if, if anybody's typed anything that I've missed, Carolyn or Jamie, have you noticed anything? Any questions? Uh, I have not. Uh, I think that you got everything, but just encourage folks to raise their hand if they'd like yeah. to. And again, like Jane said, feel free to. Oh, I see a raised hand, but it just disappeared. Katie, would you like to unmute yourself? I was going to say, just go ahead and jump in. Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, maybe a comment. I don't know what it is. Okay. <laughs> um, how do you get? How do you get parents to get to the point where they want to look ahead? If that makes sense, you know. I think that just a little background. I have an eighteen-year-old, um, and we're in that transition stage. But I think that life has always been so overwhelming. I mean, and I think I think other parents see this too, that it's so overwhelming and we we focus so much on trying to get through the day, trying to get through the week. So, you know, I, I know personally, I've never really let myself look too far ahead <laughs> because, you know, it's scary and it's it's hard to plan and, and you don't know what to expect. And then part of that is just sticking your head in the sand because it's easier. <laughs> So how do you how do you get past that? How do you get parents to start this thought process earlier? Yeah, it's hard. And I, I tell you, I'm working with a group out of Boston at a children's hospital. We were doing a Facebook group and um, it's like parents of 10 to 14 year olds. And they I mean, getting them to try to plan and to think about transition, it shut them down. They were just like, mm, nope, not going to think about it you know, like you said, sticking your head in the sand, but especially at that age. Right. Um, but 
I think nudging them as much as you can and, and teaching them the skills. And that's what we're really trying to do with this group that, that I'm working with is, okay, we're going to teach you the skills. We're going to teach you how to use a trajectory to get ready for your IEP meeting. Um, and, and, you know, that's planning, right? And that's thinking at least a year ahead, right? You're thinking about over the next year, what do you want your child's life to look like? What does education look like? What do you want them to learn about? What do you want to have happen in their school experience for the next year? And what do you want to not have happen? And getting them to start using it in ways that they see useful in the now. And then you can start nudging. It's like, you know, that was really cool the way you use that IEP. Now, how are we going to get you to, you know, you know, think about, you know, okay, well, we're thinking about the IEP now every year, but, you know, there's going to come a time in a few years where you really have to think about transition. You know, what are you, what are you thinking about there? Is there one thing you can think about that you want to make sure that when they're in that transition stage that we really think about and we really focus on? What's one thing that, that you can think about? And, you know, just, just nudging them that little bit, but getting them to use the skills and the tools, you know, the skills with the tools before they need it, right? I mean, using it for things that they find useful now, like having an IEP meeting or going to the, just getting ready to go to the doctor, you know, thinking about all the things that, you know, you want to make sure that happen at that doctor's visit. What's a good doctor's visit? What's a not good doctor's visit? And making it useful to them now so that they can then start thinking a little bit further ahead. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. It does. Thank you. That's about all I've got too, because it's, it's hard. <laughs> The day-to-day, -day, our day-to-day -day life sometimes is so consuming that it, it is really hard to think ahead. And I, I, I've been there, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Other questions, thoughts, reflections? Anything that stuck out at you today that was just like, wow. And I know we're out of time, so we're probably gonna have to stop, but. <laughs> My email and everything is, is at the end here. If you wanna contact me with any questions or if you think of something like, I wish I'd said this and, and just, you know, something that just, you know, either I have a burning question or I just have a, an aha that I just wanted to share. Feel free to, to send an email. I'd love to hear from you. So. Jane, I'll piggyback on what you were um, just commenting on and say that it helps me to sort of give a, get over the, you know, emotional and mental barriers to hear other people share their stories. And so I just want to say thank you to you for sharing your story, because I do think it can energize us even when we're super low on energy and resources. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been great being with you guys today. And thanks for, thanks for having me. I appreciate you being here. I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll go on a break if everyone will stick with us for a second. I'll talk better. Thank you I'm so much. Jane. And, um, enjoy the rest of your day. And